Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 21st, meet, uh, 21st meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please make sure everyone has got their mobile phones on silent? No apologies have been received, and I'd like to welcome Claudia Beamish from the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, who is joining us today and will be joining us during the evidence sessions that we take on the, the Forestry Bill. The first item on the agenda is the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. This is our second evidence session on the bill, and we will be having two panels today. The first panel, and welcome to you all, is, is, consists of Stuart Goodall, the Chief Executive of Comfort, Brendan Burns, Harvesting Contractor for the Forestry Contractors Association, uh, Malcolm Nicholl, Managing Partner uh, at Belogia Estates Enterprise, Hamish McLeod, Director of Public Affairs at BSW Sawmills, and Ian Thomas, a, a Chartered Forester. Um, gentlemen, we, we, we have various themes that we're going to be developing during the course of uh, the discussion today. We'll be introduced by different members. It, uh, could I ask you if you want to uh, speak on it, and you don't have to speak on every theme if you don't want to, to try and catch my eye, um, I will then try and bring you in. Could I also rem remind you to occasionally look at me because if you start um, uh, expanding on points beyond uh, the, the time that we have available, I will try to signal to you to, 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 to come to an end rather than just having to cut you off, which is always embarrassing. So um, I also just remind you, you don't need uh, to press your microphones on the, on the panels in front of you, uh, those, that your microphones will be activated as, as you're called to speak. Thank you. Uh, the first uh, question, uh, for, sorry, first theme will be developed by John Finney. Uh, hey, good morning, panel, and, and thanks very much for your, your contributions. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the first thing we're going to look at is the development of the bill, and key to that is the role that the consultation played in the process. Um, that took place in August of last year. <coughs> Bigger part. I appreciate your views specifically on two issues. That's the management of land by Scottish ministers and the issue of felling and the extent to which they were covered by the consultation, please. Who'd like to go <coughs> first on that? Oh, you're all looking very... I'm going to... Sorry, if you're not going to volunteer, Stuart, you can start with that. Um, thank you, convener. I... I suppose the hesitancy in starting to speak is we've been operating, approaching this on the basis that the legislation around felling isn't going to fundamentally change. And we can't see that there's a reason to fundamentally change it, and we're not aware of any pressures to fundamentally change it. So rightly or wrongly, we've been operating on the basis that uh, what's coming forward and what will come forward in secondary legislation will be to maintain essentially the status quo. Hopefully that's a correct assumption on our part, but time will tell. Mm. And uh, rigging you refer to as well. Oh, sorry, yeah. I mean, in terms of the, yes, I think, sorry, in terms, in terms of the consultation, we didn't yes, yes, come yes. back, uh -huh. sorry, in terms of the bill, uh -huh. yes. Um, in terms of the bill, yes, and the definition being put forward, then we are looking at it and saying it, it isn't necessarily the correct definition because it's talking about um, the uh, intentionally killing a tree because, and it sounds a bit of um, a nerdy point here, but uh, if you um, fell a broadleaf tree, that doesn't kill it. You know, if you cut it at the stump, it can yeah. re-sprout. Uh, in fact, there's coppicing a whole industry based around that. So we think that uh, that definition itself would need to be revisited. Okay, okay. On, on the land management side, John, do you want to ask yes, anyone uh, in particular? Uh, well, specifically your views. Um, maybe, of course, maybe your views are that you were very content with the, the level of consultation on that and uh, what the outcome was. And if it was, then there's no issue. 
Yeah, yeah. Ian. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the consultation is, is a key element of the whole process, and uh, there was lots in the in the act that uh, was were actually it was basically no change. And I've, I've sort of never appeared before one of these committees before, so I've uh, I watched the one you had previously, and the, sort of one of the themes was that really there's no change from the previous act. So there were certain areas where people had serious concerns about a drastic change in, in the forestry um, that were in, in, envisaged, but there were other areas where it was pretty much, as Stuart was saying, business as usual, so there were no concerns. Yes. So. Okay, okay. Well, if there's no issues with the management of the land, and, um, or, or particularly on felling, uh, the, 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 the wider programme of devolution includes, uh, not including the wood bill, um, areas such as cross-border arrangements and new organisational arrangements. Any comments on that? Uh, Stuart, and then followed by Stuart, followed by Hamish. I mean, certainly for us, the cross-border arrangements are, are very important, and we understand why they're not necessarily covered in the bill. But what we have said in our response is, we're looking at what is included in the bill in the context of how do we coordinate with other parts of the UK, for example, on plant health, because as we know, uh, disease, pests, and uh, don't uh, respect boundaries. The issue of forest research, for example, is extremely important to the sector as well, as is the collection and dissemination of statistical information. Um, at the moment, uh, for example, investment in the, uh, in the sector is predicated on understanding the future availability of wood across rather wide geographical areas and across boundaries. So, for example, the south of Scotland and north of England is essentially one geographical unit in terms of um, the, the supply and processing of timber. So having that coordination and the ability to collect that type of information and work together across countries is very important to us. So what we would like to see as part of this process of the bill is at the same time we're kept informed of what's happening in terms of the cross-border situation so that we can see this bill as part of a package. Yes, I, I would just well concur with what Stuart said there just now. But I think in addition to that, I think we're looking at a, uh, assuming a post-Brexit world and uh, the uh, the global position of forestry in uh, in Scotland and and uh, and indeed the United Kingdom, and uh, it's, a, it's a sense of scale that uh, forest research actually offers. It's a very small agency within Forestry Commission at the moment, and I think when you look at it, if it was divided two ways, three ways, it becomes so uh, so small and into Significant, in, there's a danger of it becoming so insignificant that it actually gets lost somewhere within uh, within that melee. So I think it's very important that the UK has uh, has a strong position in forest research for all the reasons that Stuart said. Uh, John, you want to? I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Stuart wanted to come in on as brief follow. I think it's appropriate to raise this here because it's about the build and the construction of it. And I'm just looking at the note Confor have provided to us today, uh, Mr. Goodall, and in particular your suggestion there should be a chief forester for Scotland. And of course, that's something that's not in the bill. And I just wondered, uh, and indeed you go on to say, Minister should commit to designating key professional posts. I must say I'm slightly cautious about ministers doing that, but, but that's a different issue which I won't bother about. Why do you think having a chief forester is something that the bill should to address. Uh, maybe others want to comment as well. I mean, our, for us as an organisation, uh, amongst our membership, uh, a very broad membership along the supply chain across Scotland, but we're also aware of speaking with uh, people uh, from different interests, so outside of industry, environmental organisations and, and others, there is a lot of support for the idea that if we're going to regulate and, and uh, support the sector, then forestry is quite a technical issue. I mean, everybody who mm. operates in, a, in a, an industry thinks that their industry and what they do is very important, very difficult and challenging task. I think if we just got to look at, uh, in forestry, that we're, the government has, in a, a, or, or through government, the Forestry Commission, those people regulating the sector, have a great deal of influence over how we establish forests, how we manage them, how we harvest them. And if you look at the guidance that are working against the UK forestry standard and all the supporting guidance, it's you know, six or seven, eight inches of, of documentation. So that level of engagement and influence and the level of detail they have to work with 
for us, it's important that the people doing that are suitably qualified, that they are professional foresters, they understand the issues. Otherwise, it would be very difficult for them to be able to effectively speak to people in the private sector who are professional foresters, who understand all that, who've been through three or four years of, of, of training, of, of further education. Um, you know, to be able to have that respect and, and to have that influence. Can I, can I just cut across you slightly, because I don't want to make a big meal mm. of this. Are you suggesting something like the chief scientist, who has no executive role in government, but is clearly a senior and respected advisor to government and to the part of government that's responsible? Is that mm. the model you're looking at, or are you looking at somebody in an executive role? I suspect it's the former rather than the latter, but it would be helpful. It's certainly, yes, in terms of definition, the, the formal role is what uh, you know, we're, we're looking at. And uh, I think that for us, as I said, it, it feeds on from the point about being able to have that sort of professional forestry expertise in place. And yes, you're right, we've used the term ministers loosely, essentially, it's having somebody in position to make that happen. But I think it would be important for the operation of regulation and support and for the respect and working relationship with the private sector, if you have those people in post and there's somebody seen to be championing and taking a lead for forestry within um, Scottish Government as a whole. I'm going to bring Hamish in and then Brendan, if I may. Say Hamish, if you... Thank you. Um, well, I was speaking with slight experience and I, I, I served six years as, uh, as chairman of the Forestry Commission of Scotland's National Committee. So I've actually seen forestry, if you like, at, the, at, at that level as well uh, from, from both sides. And um, it's something that we debated often actually within the National Committee. And I'm sure two years, three years on, it's still being so. And I think that uh, what, we, what we need in Scotland, or what we recognise in Scotland, is, a, a, is somebody to be an advocate for forestry. Right. And I think that that is, is a vitally important. I don't mean a figurehead, but an advocate for forestry, somebody who's actually going to push forestry and actually drive some ambition and aspiration within the, within the, uh, the Forestry Act as well. I mean, we've got some very ambitious planting targets, for example, and we've got, very, we've got a number of deficiencies in terms of restocking issues and so on. And we need somebody really to focus on that and say, right, okay, this is what we're trying to achieve for Scotland. Okay, and, and Brendan, before you come in, I mean, maybe you'd like to think about whether, whether the long-term nature of forestry uh, maybe makes that position more important as well rather than a short, shorter term political appointment. Brendan, sorry. As far as we would be concerned, uh, I should clarify, contractors are the people that are working in the forests. We have a slightly different scenario um, from, from uh, CONFOR in as much that what we see is the practical end of the operation. What we find at the moment is that our practical uh, aspects of forestry has been lost. You know, we, we talk to senior people within the Forestry Commission and we are talking to people that do not even understand what we do. Yes, everybody recognises a machine, but I had a discussion with a senior member of, of the Forestry Commission the, the other day and I was actually pointed out what the wage of a machine operator is. Over £40,000 a year. They didn't realise it. They didn't realise the cost of these machines are now £350,000. And that's for a basic, that's one machine. So we'd certainly support much more technical knowledge at the top, because at this moment, we're talking to a brick wall. And when we have written to ministers and to um, other senior people within the parliament, we get an answer back from the Forestry Commission, which basically says, thank you very much for your letter, now will you go away? And we have a serious problem in forestry, irrespective of what this bill says. We are hitting a cliff edge in eight years. We have no operators. Now, everybody knows about this. I've been talking about it for 20 years, and the Forestry Commission has done nothing about it. And for the life of me, I don't understand. But technically, they didn't seem to understand what was actually happening. Our operators are getting older and leaving, and if there's nobody to cut and extract the timber, there will be no forestry industry, there will be no one billion pounds, and we will be in a mess. Okay, so you, you support, I think, an advocate for, for forestry. Uh, Malcolm, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, and then, if quick, I may, we might move on to the yeah, second very, very theme. Quickly, 
come to the same angle as Brendan. Um, I mean, we've always had, had very good relationships with the local conservancy. Uh, uh, alone of the government agencies, I now always know who the field officer is, who I relate to. You have the field officer, you have the operations officer, you have the conservator, you know, uh, and it, it's clear cut and simple and straightforward. Um, beyond that, um, I've never really had any under, understanding of how forestry in Scotland is, is administered. At uh, one level, I don't need to. But with regard to trying to sort of, as I said, I have never had to scrutinise any legislation previously, thankfully. But when you start to look, it does bring open to questions. And I think there's an opportunity here to actually clarify the lines of organisation, of administration. Because as Brendan touches on, there are some very, very significant challenges to the forest industry. There's great opportunities but we've got to, to, to face up to the challenges. And I do think there needs to be a clear structure um, which you know, operates and actually runs the course because forestry has been kicked around in different schemes, different focuses. And you know, one of the things I must say, you know, there should hopefully cross-party support for a structure that is clear and that we know who we're relating to and does have, okay, shall we say, the right qualified people in the right places. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll look out for that, that theme as we move through the, the consultation. Peter, do you want to move on with the next one, if, if you may? Uh, yeah. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my, my questions are around about part two of the bill, and, and that in part two it speaks about the modernisation of the, of the forestry functions, about bringing the Forestry Act 1967 up to date. So my first question is, what is your view of the modernisation of the forestry functions in this bill, and, and does it go far enough in your view? Um, I don't know who that's who, to. Who'd like to start that? I'm, I'm nervous always about letting Stuart go first because he then gets to say more. So I will on this occasion, but I, I will look to everyone else, please. Stuart. Um, thank you, convener. I, I have a deserved reputation for being a bit mouthy, um, both in the private sector as well as in this forum. So my... I'd never said that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of, of, of modernisation, I mean... Clearly, it makes sense when you have legislation which was established 50 years ago for a very different time, based on legislation back in 1919 when we were in a very different circumstances. And therefore, it, it, there are things in here which we look at, you know, which we like. So, for example, um, the, we, we now have a an, an well understood concept of sustainable forest management, where when we're operating in forestry, it's not just about trying to get as many trees into the ground to cover every square inch of a single species as much as we can. You know, as a sector, as an industry, we moved on from that nearly 30 years ago. And therefore, it, it's good to have recognition that, that forestry is an activity which balances both production with care for the environment and um, working with, with people. So that kind of thing is, is useful. It's also good that we try and strip out a lot of all the, the, the text and everything that was in the 1967 bill it was quite difficult to read, I have to confess. I tried to read it one or two times and gave up. Um, so this, this does make things simpler from that point mm. of view. However, I wouldn't say that it, in terms of modernising or trying to bring it into the 20th, 21st century, it captures everything that we would like to see. So, for example, in the past, there was a clear uh, recognition that we wish to increase our forestry resource. In the 20th century, that was because we needed um, a strategic resource in times of, of war. But now in the 21st century, we face different challenges, but there are still challenges where forestry is a significant solution. So for climate change, we recognize that planting trees is vital if we're going to meet our, our, our ambitious climate change targets. And we're talking about moving to 15,000 hectares a year by 2024-25. Also, we know very well that, that forestry is becoming an effective local industry, providing well-paid, skilled jobs. And as we look post-Brexit, there's more of an opportunity for forestry and farming to be working together to be supporting green, vibrant rural areas. And therefore, we think it makes sense that there's recognition of the need for the benefits of expanding the forestry resource both to secure those benefits for the rural community, to support the rural industry, because we know there's going to be a dip in supply, 
and also for, for climate change. So that, that sort of ambition we feel is missing from this bill. It talks about good management and it talks about regulation and effective and developing strategies, but it doesn't have any ambition. And that's where we think it's a, a, it's a significant missing element from the bill. Just before Peter, we can, you, can, can I just to, die? Well, yeah, I, I was going to say, do you want to bring in the other, the other questions yeah. which I think you've got lined up well, on have, the basis uh, that it might bring other members of the panel in? No, well, I was going to say, I was going to do exactly that. Thank uh, you. Uh, I, I, since you mentioned sustainable forestry, forest management, uh, Stuart, um, do you think the bill changes any of that th thinking within the industry? I mean, you say it's, it's SFM is well understood and you've been doing it for the last 30 years. Is there anything in the bill that might, that might change any of that thinking going forward from here? We don't see anything at the moment which may change that, but the lack of any definition of it in the bill, I think, is a missed opportunity mm. uh, for two reasons. One is it en enshrines it so there's clarity you know, as it is. But also because what we wouldn't wish to see is, is that, um, uh, you know, without that clarity in there, groups may look at this and say, well, what is this bill about? What does sustainable forest management mean? Um, if you've got the definition in there, and I, and I appreciate from evidence given previously to the committee, is, is that there's a reluctance to put in definitions where it's felt it's relatively well known and understood. But this bill is all about sustainable forest management. It's right there in the first sentence. Mm. And there is an accepted definition, which is in the accompanying guidance. So we feel putting that in there would be a useful point just to provide clarity. OK. Anyone else like to comment? Uh, Ian, do you want to come in on that? Um, yeah, it was just a, there's, a, there's obviously the, there's the issue of sustainable forestry versus sustainable development. And there's a differentiation there that needs to be drawn, perhaps, because uh, there's a sort of, um, because they're more involved with other land uses, perhaps, and other wider issues, there's, that needs to be defined. I think there's a sustainable development aspect, perhaps. Mm. Can I just add another bit to the, to the whole thing? I mean, Stuart said, lamented the fact there was no ambition in the, in the bill, but the bill does require ministers to pre prepare and publish a forestry strategy. So per perhaps within that forestry strategy, that ambition statement could be there, Stuart. And uh, so and my question is, would you like to see the bill state that particular issues must be included in the forest strategy? It's been a fine document and is, is fully, it's a great thing for the Scottish uh, uh, timber industry and, and forestry generally. And, uh, and it just a, a sort of, again, carrying on business as usual in terms of that, that statement. And having it written into the Act is, is a positive, uh, as, as an obligation, is a positive step, I think. Mm, yeah. But as Stuart says, it's very widely understood. It has impacts on the ground and it makes a real difference to how forests are managed. So you know, it's, a, it's a good thing, I think. Brendan, do you want to come in on that? It, it was actually, when we had our discussions within the FCA, it was an area that, that people just kept saying, well, what does it say? So if, if, and it, it actually makes it very difficult for us to then respond without, because we are, we are practical people, that's what the contractors do. So we sometimes feel that uh, on this particular issue, you know, we had no comment, but we have a lot to say about it. But we were unsure as to how in fact we should then address that particular issue. The result was we didn't. Uh, a simple example that was raised at our meeting was the, the variations. You know, forestry is looked upon as being one industry for the whole of Scotland. Forestry in the Highlands is not the same as the forestry down the borders. Mm. So, you know, you've, and forestry in the northeast Naboyne is entirely different altogether. So, you know, it, it's, this sort of document was difficult to, to respond to. But that doesn't mean that we don't have opinions about it. <laughs> so strategy might help. Yeah. Ma Malcolm, do you want to come in on that? Because I well, noticed you nodding that, that it's a strategy is different across different parts of Scotland. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, it's an obvious statement. I mean, Scotland's an incredibly diverse country in all sorts of ways. Um, and you only travel a fairly short distance. <coughs> and, you know, from the forest perspective, there's very different issues. You just have to go from the north side of the Cairn to the south, and you're in very different conditions. Um, so that is one of the problems about constructing a forest strategy and policy for Scotland as a whole that actually treats everyone fairly and equally because you've got to be aware of the regional differences. Um, 
I just want to really sort of back up what Brendan said. What I find difficult, not being somebody who sort of scrutinised any legislation before, is you get statements here we have on forest strategy and things like, I mean, um, the Scottish ministers must promote sustainable forest management, you know, which, gosh, it covers masses of things. And then there's pages of detail on felling licences. And there seems to be a kind of a mismatch here. And I share Brendan's point about when you're trying to respond, you know, sort of rationally and comprehensively to this, well, what, what points do you drill into and what points you don't? Because after all, sustainable forest management means a lot of different things to different people. Um, my specific point in this was something I think very important that is missing, is that I think somewhere there should be a duty on Scottish ministers on the kind of educational training promotion side. You know, there's a lot of good work going on, say, for instance, Napier University, about the use of wood. But I don't think it's getting through to the public as a whole. And if you're talking about looking forward and sustainable Scotland, you know, timber's got a very, very big part to play. And I think that, uh, you know, a Scottish minister somewhere should be, have a role in promoting that. Now, that may be outside the scope of the bill, but I just felt it was a relevant comment. Okay, I think it's a, a, an interesting, important point. Stuart wants to. Just a, a relatively small point. Um, Malcolm, you're quite properly pointing to some things that dealt with in the legislation at high level, some in great detail, felling in particular in great detail. If it's in the bill, it takes a long time to change it and amend it. If it's in secondary legislation, in other words, dealt with elsewhere, we can change it fairly quickly. Are you, in consequence of what you're saying, suggesting that perhaps the felling bit of it, which is highly detailed, should be taken out of the primary legislation and put in secondary without changing the legal effect so that it can be adapted over time? Is, is that the effect of what you're saying? Or is it just a general observation you wish it was easier to read uh, um, legislation, which you might get quite a lot of support for? Um, I mean, it, it was a general comment in terms of, of, of trying to sort of get one's head round about where, I mean, where this legislation sits with other legislation. Right. And for an amateur, primary and secondary and what goes where. But I think actually your point that I mean, is felling licenses really appropriate in a bill of this sort? I would question that. Um, and I think it is something that is, 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 is okay. better handled under secondary. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that's, again, something we can build on. Stuart, yours is the next theme. Uh, yes, my, my, mine's fairly brief, and Stuart uh, Goodall has already referred to it. I, it it's just on uh, health and uh, civic culture material. Uh, which uh, will now essentially be in one place, uh, uh, covering both the Plant Health Act and, the, to some extent, the Plant Variety and Seeds Act of 1964. Is that a provision that uh, members of the panel support, or do you have another alternative uh, way in which these things should be dealt with? Um, everyone's looking away except for Stuart. So, Stuart, you get the floor again. <laughs> I mean, you deserve a response. So, yeah, I mean, it's something, as it is, you know, we support. We don't see any problems with it. In that case, I'm finished. Can you? <laughs> OK, fine. The, the, the next theme is, is from the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, you'll be delighted to know that I'm going to go back to sustainable forest management. Um, in Section 9, it says that forestry land must be managed in a way that promotes sustainable forest management, whatever that means to certain individuals. Um, do you think that there are any differences on the ground that Section 9 will make? And would you like to see any changes to it, or is it OK as it is? I'm looking at you, Ian, as a, as a practitioner. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, it's, I think it's, it, it does cover the... Uh, it, it, and it's because, it's, as I said, it's well understood. So I think that's that's... That's adequate, and you know it shouldn't really change anything on the ground. But it's, it's this: there's a concern, I think, that uh, with the wider remit of the of the uh, and it coming under the ministers, that um, sustainable development might trump sustainable forestry management. And I think that's a concern because that could mean that deforestation takes place when there's a, for instance, a, a big financial incentive to, to, um, to for that to occur. So there's a concern that 
the clear message of, of what the Commission has achieved over the years, and it's, it's 100 years old nearly, you know, that of, of focusing on forestry and really pushing that and being an advocate and a facilitator for forestry will be lost because there's other things come in. So. Um, Stuart, do you want to add to that? And I know Gail's got a subsequent question there. If, if I can do it, I... Gil, you asked specifically about sustainable forest management and then sort of broader in section 9.3. I mean, in terms of sustainable forest management, the comments made previously, I mean, for me, sustainable forest management is a description of a process. It's how you produce an outcome. It's a balanced process, and therefore the outcome is intended to be what's appropriate for the local circumstance because you've engaged with economic interests, social interests, environmental interests. So it's a, it's a flexible mechanism but there's a lot of guidance which is helping you to achieve that outcome and what that means for forestry. So where it's referred, we're quite relaxed. But picking up on, on Ian's point, in section 9.3, which refers to land, as we describe it, owned and or managed by Scottish ministers, I'd say you know, it's part of part three. And if part three was designed to tie up um, Comfort staff and try to understand what it meant for ours, then Scottish Government officials have been incredibly successful. Um, we think we've got our head round it, but really mainly because we've read the evidence that's been given and we've asked questions, and, and we think we're 95% of the way there. But on section 9.3, what we are concerned is, is that at the moment we would look at public forestry land, so the National Forest Estate plus land that's brought in, as being primarily there for forestry and managed for forestry purposes, for sustainable forestry purposes. And we're aware that um, the Scottish Minister, Simon Hodge, who runs uh, National Forest Estate, would like to be able to use that land for, for wider purposes than just forestry. That, that's understood. And we recognise that 200,000 hectares of the National Forest Estate are not actually covered in trees. There's 30,000 hectares of actively managed agricultural land. Therefore, it makes sense to say that that can be managed for a purpose other than sustainable forest management. But the way that it's drafted seems to imply that the forest land needn't be managed for sustainable forest management. Uh, the evidence given on June the 7th, I think it was by Carol Barker Monroe, said that the land could be managed for sustainable forest management or sustainable development. And that didn't differentiate between land which has trees on it, which we would call forestry, or is you know, land adjacent to that forest, and land which is clearly nothing to do with forest. Therefore, somebody could manage that forest for sustainable development purposes rather than sustainable forest management purposes. And what we've seen in the past is that huge areas of forest were cleared for wind farms mm -hmm. on the public estate. Now, this appears to give... Scottish ministers, whoever manages the National Forest Estate, the potential to say, actually, I can earn more money by doing all these other things other than having trees. So I'm basically going in time just going to clear all the trees away. It, it, that's that kind of lack of clarity or safety nets, which for us are, are very concerning. So, so there's an ambiguity really in, in what the, the sections of the land are, are set aside for, really, and how they're going to be managed. In Section 10b, it does mention other land and forestry land. So, given what you've said, it's not actually clear what, what sections of land are other land or forestry land or land for trees, if you like. And it's yeah. Yeah. What you've set out there is the same head-scratching you know, approach that we've had over the last week. So would you like to see more clarity over what the land is actually set aside for? I think what we said in our submission eventually is, is that we think it would make a lot of sense and be very helpful rather than describing all land as forestry land, even if it's an active farm, that just because it's owned or managed by the Scottish ministers through the Forestry and Land Scotland as it will become, but instead that you define land, forestry land as actually forestry land and land associated with a forest unit. And if it's land which is not associated with forestry, that it's, it's, it's other land. And then you can apply, for example, sustainable development practices to land which is not forestry. And you know, our second guessing of government, and I, it's always a danger to second guess you know, mm -hmm. government, is, is that 
you know, there are the provisions elsewhere in this part for land to be purchased for the purposes of sustainable development, which in themselves have no relationship to forestry. Okay. So it appears to me as though you've got two parallel strands. Well, would it not make it simpler that when you're talking about sustainable development activity, it doesn't relate to forestry. Where it is forestry, it relates to sustainable forest management, and then we'd understand what on earth is happening or could happen. Oh, sorry. Well, I'm, I'm quite keen to bring Claudia in as well. So, I, I mean, maybe I'll take one more. So, I, I, if I, Ian was first, and then I'm going to bring Claudia in. So, it's a very short point. Actually, it was really a, there's a linking point here, which is about um, forestry, basically, as we all understand, being a long-term business, and uh, and what the Forestry Commission has achieved over the last hundred years. It has been a result of the um, sort of arm's length um, working of the Forestry Commission, having a buffer between the politicians. And the, uh, and the Forestry Commission, which has facilitated its long-term role and which has been fantastic for forestry. And linking to the ambiguity on whether the land is to be managed for forestry or other things is the issue of, of direct ministerial control and whether a structure that buffered that and, and sort of didn't allow political expediency to have a huge impact on forestry would perhaps be a, a worthwhile thing to consider. I don't know. Claudia, would you like to come in at this stage? Well, that's kind of your convenient. It is to do with part three, but some of them are about uh, section 13 and uh, beyond as well, and they sort of bleed into okay. each other, so I don't know if you'd prefer if the deputy convener continued. I don't know what her line of questioning is, so I don't want to... She may well be wanting to ask questions. Well, 13's next, so, so what I might do is if... Gail, you're happy... Do you want, well, uh, I know that there's another theme along compulsory... So I'll, I'll let someone else deal with that. Thank you. To till, uh, okay. If, if well, the committee members ask the questions, okay. and then so if not, I would what, I, what I'd like to do now is, is, is bring Jamie in, because it sort of naturally feeds on to, to where you were going, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. <clears throat> yes, I think that, uh, that conversation we've been having leads nicely into where I was going to pick up, and that is around Section 13 uh, of the bill, um, which relates to uh, management of land to further sustainable development. Um, in the last uh, session we had on this, the Scottish Government stated, and it would be helpful for me if I just read this out quickly, because it, it will put some context into to this section. The purpose of Section 13 is to fulfil uh, a policy that through the new agency, uh, Scottish Ministers should have a broader land management role, moving away from a silo approach of purely managing forestry. And it also states that land under Section 13 is not forestry land, it is other land, the purpose for which should be uh, managed is sustainable development. Uh, is the panel clear, uh, first of all, what this other land is? If it's not forestry land, it's been uh, designated as other land. Uh, before we move on to the sustainable development aspects of it, and, and in general, do you, uh, if you have any specific views on Section 13, uh, now would be a good time to, to share them. Stuart's had a fairly good bash at that. Does somebody else, Hamish, would you like to come in on that? Yes. Like connecting back to, uh, to, 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 to Gail's question, which I, uh, Ian answered. Um, yeah, I don't know what this other land could be um, if it's sustainable development um, in, in, in many respects. But I think going back to, uh, to, to the basis of what is the is a sustainable forestry land, if you like, is that uh, having uh, witnessed the loss of so much land from forestry into, into other developments, wind farm developments and so on over the last few years, our sector, our, our business would be horrified to lose any, any more land from forestry. And I think somewhere in this bill we should actually be setting out almost like a de minimis that you know, we start off with the forest land that we have and um, you know that that um, we, we shouldn't actually be looking at, at 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 diminishing that. In fact, we should be building on that as as per government policy. Um, so I think we need to have some sort of uh, bottom line, if you like, uh, before we even start. Brendan, definition. you wanted to come in on that. Yes. Um, <laughs> repeat a comment that that was made. Um, does this mean the first? Uh, does this mean that the um, forestry uh, organisations become the forestry tourist board? That was the issue that was raised um, because other land tourism suddenly starts start sprouting up and tourism is an extremely attractive industry. It gives very high returns for not an awful lot of work and there is a genuine fear that the, tour, that the forestry industry could lose its um, vision 
if that side of it becomes too strong. And if we and Stuart, who we are all members of Confort, really, so we pay them to, to get the staff to go through this. If they have difficulty trying to understand this, my question is always, when it gets further down the line, is anybody else going to understand it? Because it is really difficult when you're, when you're trying to put all the different aspects into this particular paper. Okay. Um, do you, do you want to uh, no, follow want to up, and then I'd yeah. like to bring Claudia um, in? So, I mean, I, I guess following on from that, I mean, my, my interpretation of this is, again, I'm, I'm struggling with this too, is that um, land which is currently forestry land could be purchased by the government, either through commercial acquisition or compulsory purchasing, and then converted to be used for other reasons, such as, quote, sustainable development. Now, the Scottish government stated they did not want to define what sustainable development is, because they felt that that was dealt with by case law. Um, but some of the consultation responses stated that you do want that uh, to be defined. Otherwise, it does leave it far too open-ended. Does anyone agree or disagree with that? Can I just say, before, before you answer the question, don't please major on the compulsory purchase bit, because that's going to come up later. Um, so I don't want to cut across your answers for that. but. Um, I'm going to take Stuart, and then I'm going to bring Claudia in, and then I'll take other ones. So, Stuart. Yeah, certainly. I, I, I'll leave aside the issue of the rights and wrongs or, of compulsory purchases. I mean, quite simply, after going through this for a length of time, we look at Section 13 and effectively see it as a standalone activity, which is separate from forestry. So, it's the ability to acquire or purchase land which is not necessarily forestry and probably isn't forestry, and then not do anything related to forestry. So it's a sort of land provision, non-forestry land provision. And from our point of view, as a forestry organisation, we could say, well, there's almost like a piggybacking of this provision within the rest of, all, the, rest of the bill, which is all about forestry, and therefore you know, we can put that to one side. But the inclusion of sustainable development as a term in then in 9.3 is where it gives us concern because at that point it brings that term and its impact into forestry land and the land. That, and once you start looking at the National Forest Estate as being all lands suddenly being classified as forestry land, and then there's purchasing of land, which is not forestry land, but may be used for forestry land, that's when we just got ourselves tied up in knots because we cannot entirely separate, and we don't think there's a separation, although the evidence seemed to imply there was, between a simple process of acquiring land for sustainable development and then having nothing to do with forestry. That no, seemed to be I mean, what I'm saying, but it wasn't actually specifically said in the evidence. Sorry, I'm going to stop you there, because I'd like to... I think you've made the point very clearly on that. Uh, Claudia, would you like to come Thank in? Thank you, Kavina, and good morning to the panel. Uh, it's really building on the, the previous questions. Um, and I wonder if the panel actually see any need for the Scottish Government to have new powers to further sustainable uh, development in the context of this bill. And if any of you can think of any examples where it would be appropriate to use the powers in Section 13. And as a, as a quick um, additional question, um, with the convener's forbearance, um, where does agroforestry fit into um, this? Um, who would like to... I mean, that's quite... That, it, it, it might be a quick question. There may be a long answer. No, but I'm, if we I'm could keep the answer short, short Ian, answer. if I could perhaps bring in. Hey, um, I, I, the, on the first question, the, the, actually, basically, the powers are all there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the old theme of, um, of uh, if it isn't broken, don't bother fixing it. Because, actually, forestry in Scotland is a tremendous success story and is a totally functional thing, as is delivered now. You know, um, on, on the second point, agroforestry, um, th there's no... I mean, there is, it's, it's a thing that's promoted by the Forestry Commission at the moment, but I would, I, being, having done agriculture and forestry, I would um, be greatly in favour of it having a you know, higher profile. It is in the present grant system, which is varying off the bill a bit. But, uh, so it's there at the moment, but, and, but that would be a simple, to promote that would be a simple um, uh, thing of in, increasing grant rates or promoting it more widely within the grant system. So, yeah. Anyone else want to give a quick answer to that? Uh, Stuart, I'll let you in. Very quickly, 
as, as a forestry organisation, we don't have anything specific to do with sustainable development purchasing for sustainable for development purposes, which have nothing to do with forestry. Um, but it's also powers relating to compulsory purchase and acquisition for forestry. And our response is on that point that, A, it's not something that has been used to any degree. Uh, it's the, when challenged to say what it'd be used for, there was no real explanation given of why it would be used. And there, our sort of normal approach would be to say, if there is no clear justification for it, then why include it? Including it does contain in itself uh, some potential threats to people who may wish to plant forests if they feel that by planting forests they're bringing themselves within the ability to have the land purchased by government. So it could be argued that it's a disincentive to tree planting. So for us, on balance, we would say we'd better not to have it than to have it related to forestry. Now, Mike is looking at me because that, he wanted to particularly ask on compulsory purchase. Do you want to do a follow-up sort of almost on that answer? Yeah. Thank you very much, Convener. <clears throat> I'm particularly exercised by Section 16 of this bill, um, on where it says the Scottish ministers may compulsory acquire land that they require for the purpose of exercising their functions under sustainable forest management and sustainable development. That's Sections 9 and 13. When I asked the uh, team, bill team leader, Carol Barker Munro, on the 7th of June, I said, the bill does not just transfer current compulsory purchase powers under the law as it stands, it increases ministers' compulsory purchase powers. And Carol Barker Munro said, yes, that's correct. And when I pressed further to for examples, they weren't forthcoming. So my, my question really is to the, to the panel. I mean, I'm initially suspicious of giving uh, Parliament giving more powers to ministers anyway when we don't know what they're being used for. What do you think about Section 16, the compulsory purchase of land, moving from the current position of the 1947 Act to this much wider aspect of giving ministers what seems to me to be quite wide powers? Stuart, you, you sort of answered that already, so I'm, I'm going to st steer away from you. Maybe I could go to Ian and then Malcolm. Maybe you'd like to get to give a view on that, Ian. Um, I mean, I, I suppose the thing about forestry is it's a... It's a it's actually a culture in Scotland. It's, it's, a, it's a cultural entity that depends on the people within it, and it depends on those people within it getting on. So there's a good reason why the Forestry Commission has never used effectively the compulsory powers it had over many, many years, because annoying farmers and, uh, and every other landholder and all the rest of it is, is not a good way to go about promoting forestry. So I, I don't actually see... It, there may be exceptional circumstances when it's, when it's useful for, for someone who's been very obstreperous or whatever, or for a very good reason, but generally, I don't see any reason to extend the powers at all, actually. And uh, I, I think it would be counterproductive in many cases. So. Malcolm, do you want, do you want I mean, to... Just simply say, I mean, I mean I, I, I'd be fully in agreement with what um, Ian has said. Um, I don't think, if this is a bill to promote forestry, I don't think that this clause about compulsory purchase actually furthers that aim. Okay. Does, does anyone on the panel want to speak to give a contrary view to that? Because if not, I'm, I'm minded to leave it at that. Yeah, uh, I just, yes. the, just so that I've got this right, do the panel members believe that the compulsory purchase powers that were in the 47 Act are sufficient, or does it, are you saying that we don't need the increased powers over sustainable development? Again, if, if the Forest Commission exercising those powers or the Scottish ministers exercising those powers, and the Scottish uh, the Forest Commission have always thought, they've, basically they don't do compulsory purchase for very good reasons, as I've just said, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a forestry culture. We all depend on each other. Whereas ministers may have slightly different objectives. So they're perfectly adequate as they are. The, the ideal thing is not to use them unless in extreme circumstances. Uh, but changing it to, A, having Scottish ministers having more of a say in it, and also um, uh, for other development is, is I think, is, is, is not really forestry. It's extending the remit of the bill way beyond what it is. Okay. Ian, can I just ask, have you, have you any examples of compulsory purchase powers being used by the Forestry Commission to further their aims for timber? None, none whatsoever. No, no, okay. No, no. And the whole panel shaking their head right. I think if we may, we'll move on and ask John to develop the next theme. Uh, thanks, Convener. 
Um, sections 18, 19, 20 talk about delegation to community bodies. So I was just interested to ask you and get your views around that. Um, I mean, firstly, do you think the definition of community bodies in section 19 is appropriate? And um, I'll just put it all together. Um, I mean, if, if we, we've just discussed compulsory purchase, if there is compulsory purchase, do you think it's appropriate that ministers should be able to then delegate the management uh, to community bodies? Um, quite contentious question in that. Uh, Stuart, do you want to lead on that? <laughs> yes. Um, we are, as an organisation, you know, believe that forestry is something which um, all uh, types of organisations, all types of uh, you know, parts of the country, communities, and all can benefit from being active in. I mean, something we're very keen to see is um, communities planting land and, and um, becoming active in, in woodland. And we have seen examples, for example, in Northwest Mull, where you have a community which has taken on a previous uh, owned by forestry commission or managed by the forestry commission piece of forest and turned that into a real success story. So we look at that and think, well, there are really good examples out there. So uh, you know, th this approach can work. When we looked at this, there was, you asked two questions. One thing was sort of definition and then, you know, compulsory purchase to, to um, allow them to, allow communities to take on areas of forest. What seems strange to us is, is that there's, there's a definition and then we have points A to H and then there's the ability for Scottish ministers, if they wish, to ignore B to H. And that to us seemed a bit strange. Um, you know, there's a lot of detail there and then you give Scottish ministers the ability to basically ignore all the detail to disapply all those elements. So we would challenge whether that actually makes sense. Um, and how you would deal with that? I mean, would you just take the definition out and leave the definition looser to start with, or would you restrict the ability of the ministers to change it? You're now probably asking questions which are both above my pay grade intelligence okay. and, and, and interest. Okay, but, I can ask, uh, I'll ask someone <laughs> another time. But uh, you know, we, we do feel that it's important if you have something which is specifically providing for the purchase of forest, um, which is it's an asset which we think is very valuable and important to the sector as a whole, that it, it, there should be something in there which defines what you're trying to achieve and sets it why it should happen. And in that principle, taking B to H and saying it could be set aside does seem to be providing a lot of flexibility to Scottish ministers, and therefore we would believe it should be somewhere in the middle, but I don't have an exact point okay. to which I could put to. Um, and I'd also flag up that in terms of you know, compulsory purchase and then passing these things on, if it's if in the area of sustainable development, as I said, if it's sustainable development of non-forestry land that's purchased and then it's going to be used for non-forestry purposes, then we're not making a comment on that. So that was the activity. If it's, I don't see why, and it's not been in the bill, there would be compulsory purchase of forest land to pass it on to a community. There has been nothing in the whole bill or in the evidence or supporting documentation which say that that was something that would be intended or there's a reason for doing that. If that was allowed for under this, then we'd have a concern because it's not being stated as, as a possibility. It would be almost like saying we can take land from somebody to give it to somebody else, and we would have serious concerns about that in principle. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on that? Sorry. Uh, very briefly, because the, the next subject is quite big, and um, yeah. Section 16 does give the minister that power. It does specifically in the bill give the minister the power to do that. Does he not? Does it not? That's where you know, it comes back to the time we were scratching our heads. We, we, we provided our brief to the committee late mm -hmm. yesterday afternoon mm -hmm. because we were still struggling to understand some of this and, and the actual meanings and what powers it gave. Um, so that was one thing that we really didn't quite get our head totally around. Mm -hmm. But if there was an ability to buy forestry land to transfer to a community, mm -hmm as opposed to sustainable development of non-forestry land, then we would have a real concern. OK, okay. Well, I'm going to bring Raider, Raider in. Sorry, the, there are a few more questions. I'm going to try and bring them in, but it is going to curtail the section 
uh, that's coming up. So, uh, Just a quick scenario for you. It, quite often forestry land is landlocked and you can't get it out and it falls into disrepair. Quite o and quite often a community will see an opportunity for um, local businesses, local community heat schemes and the like to use that. If the landowner is just going to hang on to that land and not pass it on to the community, then it's arguable that the, the forest falls into disrepair and is not managed. So therefore, that would be a scenario where land could be compulsory purchased and then handed on to the community to preserve it as forestry and working forestry. A very brief answer, Stuart, if I may. Yes, urge you. yeah. I mean, I can understand where you're coming from. I think where we in forestry are very concerned about is, is that you can, if you're, if you're running a business, you're in there every single day, well, or at least five days a week. If you're managing farmland, you're managing it pretty much every single day. With forestry, you can realistically plant that forest, do some maintenance work for a few years, and then not do any activity there for 20 to 30 years. You, it actually makes sense to go in and thin it and do something more often, but you could say, I'm not going to go into that forest for 30 years. So how do we come up with a definition which, or a, 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 something which is clear, which says actually that land is just being a, unutilized and it's actually just waiting to be utilized? And I think that's a very gray area for us and it could, you know, would raise concerns. Okay, Claudia, I'm going to bring you in. Thank you, Convener. Um, just for, for the record, I, I think that um, it is actually from uh, B until F that can be disallowed, and it is important that G and H are both there, um, just simply because they are financial um, issues. Um, I'd just like to know uh, whether any of the panel have any concerns about the definition of community as, as in this section 19, um, as it is different from that in the Community Empowerment Act and also in the Land Reform Act and other legislation. And so, that has to be brief. So just to clarify that, the, that whether the panel are happy with the definition yes. including B to uh, F. Well, no, I'm just hi highlighting that actually um, it, it was just a, a, a point of for the record that... Um, the disallowance by ministers is actually from B to F, not B to H. Okay. And I just think that's important. But, but the question is about um, whether they have any, or are you content, to put it more positively, with the definition of community? Uh, very briefly at this stage, please. Um, I, I'll let you go on that, Malcolm. Well, I mean, I, I, I think I suggested that was something that, I mean, I would, would hopefully the committee would look at, because I think it is get very difficult if you've got different definitions in different bits of legislation. The trouble is that effectively defining what a community is, which in some cases may be very few individuals because forestry sometimes is in a remote area. Um, but um, so it, it's again this thing about uh, there's a big diversity. How you define effectively that diversity, I don't know. But I think that a sort of commonality to, as far as possible would be, would be valuable. Okay, I'm going to leave that uh, section there, if I may, and move on to the next section, which Fulton McGregor is going to introduce. Uh, thanks, Convener, and <coughs> thanks, uh, panel. I um, just wondering if the, the panel agree with the Scottish Government view that the committee heard that a broader view of failing is needed, and are you content that what is proposed is consistent with the sustainable, sustainable forest management? And just to, um, you know, to bring the questions together, do you believe that there's been ad adequate consultation in this part of the bill regarding failing? So, who'd like to... Uh, Malcolm. Could, could I start and say that, um, although there's a lot here about felling, I think there is something missing, um, and that is what I would describe as the current exemptions, uh, which are actually extremely important. Um, for instance, you don't need a felling licence for felling in a, a garden or, a, or an orchard, um, nor for doing certain kinds of arboric or a cultural work. But the one that is crucial to land management is the fact that there is a, a, a small but defined amount of um, timber that you can cut on a per quarter or annual basis. And this is important. Like, say, for instance, example, we're replacing an old fence line at the moment because, of course, of time, quite a lot of birch has grown up. Now, it's just a practical thing, whether you're, you're a farmer, a land manager, whatever you're doing, that well there's a small level of uh, timber to be cut, that that should be allowed. Now, I don't see anywhere here any um, reference to the, sort of the, the current exemptions. I suggest that the current exemptions might be um, uh, revised and modernised 
Um, but that would be my concern in here. Uh, I think that was raised last week that there was no mention of, I think there's a certain amount of, a certain amount of cubic meters that can yeah. be felled for firewood each year, um, which, which didn't need consent, which wasn't in there. And I think the government accepted that. Does anyone have any additions to that? Hamish, do you want to? to agree with what Marcus Okay, says, Brendan. Just purely practical, to give an example, um, we, we, you usually find yourself on a forest site, you're clearing away wood. For whatever reason, the timber is not moving away. You need to increase the size of a lay-by. Can't do it. All of a sudden, your whole operation is going to a halt. And that's happened many times. Um, and this flexibility, the need for flexibility, especially in the operation, um, is, is vitally important. Okay. Jamie, I'd like to bring you in, if I may, on, on that as well. Vinod, can I? Sorry. Uh, just a, I, it was just a second part of the question. Perhaps it was my, uh, my fault for, for combining both together, but uh, and maybe I missed it in the answer, but did, you, did the panel feel that there was adequate consultation on the failing part of the bill? Uh, Stuart, would you... Would you yeah, just a very brief answer, yeah. Would you like to comment on that briefly, if I may? <laughs> I mean, I can make... Uh, I, I, my comments, essentially, the, you know, the, the feedback I gave to, to sort of John Finley earlier on is, is that... You know, there was an awareness that this would be included and our expectation and understanding was that we would be operating on a similar basis as we are currently. So in terms of feeding back, it's a very detailed area. So we're looking for reassurance about similar outcome. And if we are assured of a similar outcome, including the issue around exemptions, then we're content. Okay. Jamie, can I... Bring you in, uh, I think that uh, leads nicely into uh, how we approach, how the bill approaches felling. Um, the, the Scottish Government's view on this very much is that they would prefer to have this in, uh, detailed in regulation as opposed to detailed in the bill itself. Uh, so they want to work with the sector, uh, according to their evidence last time, uh, to uh, create that leg, leg, uh, regulation post-legislation, do you have any views on if that's the best approach or if you feel that you're very much part of that consultation process? Uh, Brendan, would you like to, to... Simple answer, no, we're not part of it. Contractors okay. are excluded and I, for the life of me, can't understand it uh, because we have, we've got the practical end of the experience. It's not, it's not just the Parliament, it's all the way through from the top to the bottom, especially with the Forestry Commission, no consultation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty forthright. Stuart or, or Malcolm, would you like to come in? You both looked so you might have an answer there. I mean, from our perspective, um, we're operating on the basis of trust uh, in that we can't see why there would be a reason to change this, you know, the outcome. And therefore, um, we understand there are benefits in having information detail in secondary legislation because that is, you know, has been highlighted earlier, is, allows for easier changes to be made. At the moment, we're not aware of any reason why we should be questioning the approach. Um, and as long as that remains the case, we're prepared to work with what we're advised is the legislative basis which allows this to operate most efficiently. <clears throat> okay, um I might just try and bring Fulton in to try and round that up a bit, because I think you had a couple more questions on that. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Hi, again. I um, wonder if the panel are aware of any circumstances which might arise where Scottish ministers might refuse an application for failing a uh, permission, and uh, overall, you know, how do you anticipate any changes on the ground as a result of the provisions? So, Ian? I, I, mean, I can't see it actually having much impact. I mean, felling has to be regulated. I think we'd all agree on that. Um, in a, to, to, at the moment, to engage in a felling activity, you generally have to have a forest of any size. You have to have a forest plan or a management plan and have to agree that with a commission. And uh, the commission are pragmatic people and they, they don't throw in objections to felling for economic reasons and all the rest routinely. So... Um, I don't see there's, there's much there to be concerned about because it's pretty much business as usual, which does work, as far as I can tell from where I'm standing. And does anyone have concerns on, re on refusals? I mean, there might be ones for, for wildlife. I mean, is that a concern or is it not a concern? Can I... <laughs> Briefly. For the top, yes, for the, for the wildlife side, um, that 
is a major problem. The contractors recognise the problem, um, but the, the, what happens is that you, you maybe hold it, you've got to work ahead of time. And the planning process takes, seemed to take so long that if you actually looked at all the reasons why we can and cannot harvest, there's about two weeks in the year we can harvest. It's, it's shocking. I mean, we know wildlife issues are important. Gosh, we believe in it. But the way that it's working at the moment is just not practical. Stuart, do you want to briefly add something to that? Yes. I mean, very briefly, what I say is, is that we're not aware of issues in terms of an absolute refusal to fill, i.e. you can never harvest these trees. I mean, clearly, if you've got very important you know, nature, woodland, and things like that, it's, it's appropriate to apply those. But where you've got um, a managed productive forest, then, yes, I, I would um, support Brenda's points. It's not necessarily to do with an you know, absolute refusal, but there are guidance in place about um, when you can harvest so that you don't uh, disturb, for example, birds. And what we feel is, is that um, everything that we've seen, in particular, you know, we're told that birds of prey are disturbed and that um, you, know, you, there's, you have to keep certain hundreds of metres away. And then you have birds of prey coming down, eating the sandwiches off the of the harvester cab's desk that, you know, when the guidance has been set, but that guidance itself we feel is perhaps incorrectly set and the danger is, is that felling legislation can be used to create a blockage that then allows that guidance to kick in. But what we see is not necessarily taking away that, that the issue of the felling and the control is to make sure the guidance is correct. Okay, I'm afraid there, there are one or two other questions uh, that are stacked up, which unfortunately I'm not going to get to, so we may submit those uh, as, as written questions afterwards. Peter, can I ask you to move on to the next theme, please? Yeah, uh, I want to explore a wee bit about notices to comply and compliance, and this, the, the, these come in throughout the bill. In Chapter 6, for instance, it's about registering notice to comply with continuing conditions, conditions felling and restocking, for instance. Sections 42 to 47 provide Scottish Minister with powers to ensure that directions relating to felling are, are complied with. And then there's a bit in sections 48 to 58 about providing powers to ensure that the action required is undertaken. So do you think that the compliance and notice to comply provisions are an improvement on the current system or could they be better? So I, I, I know I'm not going to get a short answer. Yes or no would be fine, but... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, broadly, um, uh, I don't see any massive change here. This is not something that comes up a lot. Obviously, there has to be powers for the Scottish ministers if something has not been carried out, which we agreed to be carried out for them to come uh, uh, in and, and force it. But generally, this is done at field level with field officer, uh, and, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not contentious. Right. Okay. Stuart, do you want to say something... No, I, I think I would simply say that I, I, think it, I agree it's about appropriate implementation and what we've seen is implementation that we're broadly in agreement with and therefore it's very complex legislation. It is pretty much following, taking through what was there before and as long as the, the, the intent of the legislation is similar and the way it's applied is the same, then we would be content with it. Okay, okay I, yep. I, I may move on and ask Rada to ask uh, the, the, the next questions. This question's a bit of a, a catch-all. Um, other than what's already been discussed and talked about, is there anything that was in the 1967 Forestry Act that should be in this Act that is missing? Anything that is missing from both that you'd have liked to have seen and indeed any un unintended consequences from the changes? Does anyone feel that anything's been missed yet? It's maybe not something that's, spe that's actually specifically missing. Um, Although, with the, the previous act, there was the, uh, you know, the purpose, the intention, the ambition to be expanding the resource, and that ambition applied to both the private sector and to publicly owned forest. And it comes back to, you know, references a point I made earlier about the, our concern that on the, the publicly owned forest, the publicly managed forest, there is the potential for the forest to be cleared because it's seen to have lesser value, uh, economic value. For us, we look at the, the National Forest Estate as being hugely important for the future of the sector. About a third of the wood supply that supports 25, 26,000 rural jobs and a billion pound industry comes from the forests which are owned and managed by Scottish ministers. And therefore, there, what we see, there's nothing in here which recognises that or seeks to protect that. 
and the investment that's been taken on, I'm sure Hamish could go into a lot more detail than I can, about the need for that long-term confidence to underpin this long-term investment, that at the moment there's nothing in there which seeks to protect the status of that forest, and that's of concern to us. Stuart, you've made that point several times, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure we have indeed picked that up. Is there anything, anything that anyone feels is particularly missed? Well, missed, it's a matter of what way it's sort of handled. It goes back to what we were discussing, because now that the Scottish ministers take the place of the commissioners, they ultimately are responsible for seeing the restocking on the National Forest Estate. But they are the people who actually enforce to see that the restocking pl takes place anyway. So I just wonder if there's an issue there. It goes back slightly to what was raised earlier about having a, a chief forest officer. You know, th there seems to be almost a situation here that the person who is responsible for the action is also the person who's responsible for policing it. Uh, I, I haven't got an answer to that one, but it seems to me a potential issue. Okay, we there is concern about restocking. Uh, I must make that point uh, yeah. across the board. We may leave that hanging and, and move on, if I may, to, to John, who is just going to do the, the final theme. Just a very uh, quick question about the financial memorandum. Uh, according to the financial memorandum, it says there will be no financial implications for local authorities, other bodies, individuals or businesses. Are you all comfortable with that? Stuart, why don't you answer that? Because if you get this wrong, it will obviously be coming out of COM4. <laughs> yes, fine. I, I've never been asked to underwrite um, government expenditure before. But, uh, yeah, no, our understanding is, is that, that the costs associated with the you know, generally associated with you know, rebranding, etc., and, and internal changes, and therefore they will be falling on um, Forest Commission, Scottish Government, rather than local authorities or other bodies. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I would just like to ask one final question, if I may. We've, I've heard from Stuart and from Malcolm that there was some concern that, that all this is being placed in the hands of politicians and there might be a role for a forestry supremo who, whose job is to promote forestry. I'm not convinced that I've heard from Ian, Hamish and Brendan very briefly on whether you would support that, that principle. Uh, or, or whether you're just happy with everything going to the Scottish Government. But, uh, Hamish. Yeah, if I, could, if I could say again, you know, in that uh, forestry, when, it's, uh, when, when both sides of forestry, if you like, has been in the same house, we've had the, the overarching, the National Committee, we've had uh, the Regional Forum and so on. So we've had a, a structure of uh, checks and balances and we've had an Audit and Risk Committee. I think uh, one of my concerns would be that when the... Uh, what we call the old forestry authority a bit of it disappears into into government um, into uh, into as, as, a, as a department or a division of government that there isn't that public overseeing if you like in terms of what uh, what their activity is the checks and balances that's not clear at this stage how that would actually be managed Ian yeah, I'd, I'd uh, support that actually I think that's it, it, it sounds nice having a, a sort of champion for forestry and I, I think that would be that would be good without knowing the detail but I think it's it's more important than an individual I think with as I said forestry is a culture and the Forestry Commission for 100 years has been the linchpin of that culture in Scotland and so we can achieve what we've done so far and if we dissipate the Forestry Commission by the Forest Enterprise section, there's less concern about that, but it's the conservancy for practical foresters of putting that, taking that culture and putting it into a much bigger one. We all know it's a critical mass issue here. You've, you've got to keep a critical mass to maintain a culture, and we in Scotland obviously appreciate that. And the point is that if you put that into a much bigger culture and it's not protected, or even if it's protected on the, it's supposedly protected, it'll still just inevitably dissipate and be dispersed. And that culture is more important than an individual championing forestry. It's the whole forestry in Scotland is a fantastic organisation, and it's achieved a lot. I mean, if you look at the way changes have been made, we may get we may get reassurances on on you know that it'll be protected, everything's going to be fine. But if you look at the where it's happened elsewhere, for instance, in in Wales and um, with historic Scotland, perhaps in, in, in Scotland, that, that dissipation of, of talent and enthusiasm and a culture, that's gone. And that's what we're going to do. We, uh, my fear is that we will destroy that whole forestry culture by incorporating it into Scottish Government. OK. And uh, Brendan, do you want to give a, a short...? I'll give a short one. I, I, 
It's about trust and confidence. Uh, the forestry industry, to me, is not... I, I've, I've got a, I should explain, within Europe, I've got a wider remit, which includes agriculture. I, I, I work in the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, and what I see is a huge problem with the rural community of businesses, agriculture and forestry, and the way that it is presently operating. We need people with practical experience that actually understand what happens in the rural areas, and we're not getting it. And if you just look at things like the supermarkets and the farmers with milk, that is the same problem that's going on at the moment. And the money is not staying in the rural communities. We keep hearing about forestry, and we talk about sawmills, etc. These are urban businesses employing urban people. Rural communities are not, they only benefit when the money goes to the landowner, and hopefully that landowner actually lives in Scotland and doesn't live in Canada, New Zealand, uh, and Australia. Uh, <laughs> so this is an issue about money going into the rural community. Okay. And that issue has never been addressed. So we need technical people at the top that are going to actually discuss the wider issues of forestry. At the present moment, that debate is not taking place. Okay. Well, maybe that's the best place to leave that and, and, and say thank you to Stuart, Brendan, Malcolm, Hamish, Ian, for, for the evidence you've given. There may be further questions that the committee want to ask. And if there's some things that you think we haven't looked at closely enough and you want to give evidence to the committee, please do write into the class. I'd like to now very briefly suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to change over. And thank you again for your evidence this morning.
Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd now like to continue uh, with, the, with the evidence session, uh, which is agenda item one. Um, and I'd like to welcome the second panel today. Uh, and first of all, David Henderson Howitt, the chair of the Central Scotland Forestry Forum. Claire Glaster, the chair of the Grampian Regional Forestry Forum. Uh, Patrick Hunter Blair, chair of South Scotland Forestry Forum and Richard sterling Erd, the chair of the Perth and Isle Gulf Forestry Forum. Uh, we've also received written evidence from the Highlands and Islands Forestry Forum, who sadly were unable to attend. Uh, if I could just remind panel members, if you have or haven't given evidence before, that you don't need to push the buttons. The buttons will be, and your speakers will be activated. If I could ask you to look to me if you want to give an answer, and I'll try and bring you in. And uh, also, once you start giving your answer, if I could ask you to keep an eye on me as well, just in case you um, go off on a tangent and I need to, to bring you back, it saves cutting off your microphone, which may be incredibly rude. I haven't had to do that yet. So the first item, or the first theme that we're going to do is, is going to be from John Finney. Good morning, panel. Uh, I, I, I suspect some of you, if not all of you, were present uh, when we kicked off last time. It is about the development of the bill and the role that the consultation played in that, what was and wasn't consulted upon. So in particular, are you content uh, um, with how thorough the consultation was, specifically on the management of land by Scottish ministers and on the issue of failing? So it's the consultation around that, please. Who'd like to go with that? David, would you like to Well, convener, I think actually the word on the street is the consultation exercise and didn't really listen to the responses. And if you read the policy memorandum, for example, it very much focuses not on the responses for individuals, but the responses from organisations. And we're told that over half the organisations responded yes to question one. But if you actually look at the detail, even that isn't quite true. 49 said yes out of 107, and quite a lot said don't know. And question one was also a double question. It was our proposals are for a dedicated forestry division in the Scottish Government at an executive agency to manage the National Forest Estate. So it was a double question, and as I say, it seems that the, what's in the bill reflects what was proposed in the consultation document and not much attention was paid to the consultee responses. Does anyone, do, Claire, do you want to come in on If that? I could just reiterate what David said about question one, certainly in Grampian we felt unable to support um, either yes or no on that answer, simply because we felt we needed to comment on both individually. Both had pros and cons, which we weren't able to comment on in that question, or the way the question was formed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Patrick. Um, South Scotland, exactly the same. Uh, uh, we were unhappy with the idea of the, the formation of a division within, within government. Uh, I responded accordingly to the consultation, looked at the analysis of, of the responses to the consultation, uh, and so, well, actually, they didn't tie in with, with uh, what the government was saying, that the majority of people, uh, including the majority of organisations, were not in favour of setting up a, for of a forestry division within government. John, do you want to develop that? Yeah, yeah it, it, it was more on what was consulted on rather than the, the particular analysis of responses, because I, I think that's quite often open to interpretation and, you know, the relative value that you put on a representative body regarding one individual and the extent of knowledge they may have there. Um, the, the, the issue specifically of management of land is something that you, the previous panel touched on. Um, was there a need to consider this as part of a new forestry bill, perhaps, might be the question? Patrick, yeah. Um, this is where I'm going to show my, my, my lack of experience in, on, on these matters. But I, I struggle to see um, what is appropriate to be uh, contained within the bill, uh, what might be in secondary legislation, and indeed what might be within uh, the forestry strategy uh, once it's made. So I, I see the bill as enabling, empowering, etc., government, but the detail of that then follows after that and isn't necessarily restricted by that. Okay. Uh, sorry, Richard, did you want to come in on that? Yes, I would agree with that. And, and going back to the first point, the Perth and Argyle Forum, um, which consists of uh, 12 members drawn from uh, public and private sector organisations of very farming, forestry, SEPA, um, were all um, 
of a mind that it was a very bad idea to um, subsume the Forestry Commission into government and keeping it as an executive agency with its own brand, a very valuable brand, was um, very much the, the whole forum's choice. And uh, we, we, like the, the previous speakers, we, we were not very happy with the analysis of that when it came through, because clearly the majority, the great majority of respondents were of the same view as ourselves. Um, but when it comes to the management, I would agree with Patrick that the bill is fairly bland. Um, it doesn't go into any detail about uh, management. Um, I mean, for instance, on stra uh, the strategy, forestry strategy, uh, we think that should um, go down to a, a much more local level. Okay. Um, well, we're going to develop the strategy in a minute. Um, John, do you want to develop that more, or should I, could it, I bring Stuart in on, on the, what should be in the bill and what's not? I mean, if you'd like to develop... There were just two other small points, yes. if, I, if I may, yeah. please, convene. And, and that was the, the wider programme of, of devolution of forestry includes um, things not included in the bill, and that was the cross-border arrangements and the new organisational arrangements. Are you happy with the direction these uh, parts of the programme are moving in? Um, uh, David, if you'd like to start, I'm very happy. It, whichever way you speak to then take somebody else if, if they've got an opposing view, David. Happy with the direction, just serious worries about what actually is going to come out. There's, there's an awful lot of unknown still about the outcome of the discussions with DEFRA and the Welsh Government and whether the money for research, for example, will be forthcoming. So still a lot of unknowns there. Does anyone have a contrary view or, or, or further concerns? Oh, Claire. Um, I don't have a contrary view, but and it follows on from what Stuart Goodall was saying earlier, that um, as well as the three main priorities that are in the bill for cross-border cooperation, I would certainly stress that the whole forecasting inventory be considered as well. Um, basement of investment decisions, as Stuart was saying, but also if the methodologies are slightly different, if the timing is slightly different of what's done in Scotland as opposed to other, other countries, and that could be an issue. Um, and on a personal level, I, I know that skills and education are devolved, but the skills required to operate a harvesting machine in Scotland are, are the same as those in England. I would like to see reassurance that those links will be maintained as well. Okay, many thanks indeed. Okay, Stuart, you, you have a... Uh, yes, I want to go back to what uh, Confor... Uh, put in their submission to today's meeting, uh, which says, to ensure retention of professional staff in the long term, the bill should create a post of chief forester for Scotland. Um, and I'll also add to that the Highlands and Islands Forestry Forum uh, response to the consultation uh, said governance and accountability are critical. Uh, how appointments are made is key to the whole thing. Now, the specific proposal I want to go to that Comfort have made and just to explore what your views are, it, the chief uh, forester that's proposed, I'm interested to know whether you think that is someone who should be a champion external to the management of this activity, or whether you think that it's really important that the chief forester, or whomsoever called, is the person who manages it. And, and the model I put to uh, the previous panel was that of the chief scientist, who doesn't manage anything in government, but is simply the independent conscience of science that prods government and champions science in the whole of government. These are not necessarily the only alternatives, of course, the way I choose to put it. Uh, so how do you think about the chief forester idea put forward by Confor? Who'd like to lead on that? Um... Patrick, do you want to go on that? Yeah, I, I'll start on that, if you like. Um, it actually wasn't the concept that I had considered or the, or the South Scotland Forum had considered before today. Um, and having sat through uh, the evidence from, from the first panel this morning, uh, I'm not sure I'm any clearer in my own mind and, and therefore in the mind of the South Scotland Forum whether uh, if there is a, a, to be a chief forest officer, whether that person has an executive role or, or, or is non-executive. But, but I, I do think it's important if, if that uh, post is being created that they have a professional forestry background or an academic forestry background. Um, I, and, I, and I've looked... I intervene. Yeah. There is a distinction between these two things that you would accept. Which would you give higher priority to? I would like to see it professional. 
Right. And, and, and I think if, 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 if the, the committee has time uh, to, to look at experience in other, in other countries, in Ireland, North and South, and in Wales, uh, and to see what's happened there, uh, where chief forest officers have various roles. Some of them have come from a background of, of administrative civil servants. Uh, some of them are professional foresters. Some of them are academics. Uh, and I think there are lessons to be learned fr fr from uh, okay. uh, other countries. I think I may leave that one there and move on to the second theme, which Peter is going to, to introduce. Right. Good morning, folks. Um, my my, level, my questions are around about functions in part two of the bill, which is, which is about modernisation of the forestry functions, bringing the Forestry Act of 1967 up to date. So do you believe that this goes far enough in the new bill? And it also talks in the bill a lot about sustainable forest management. Uh, we think it's a well understood and well used within the industry. And do you think that the bill changes how the industry will work in respect of sustainable forestry management. So, um, who would like to lead off on that? Um, you're, you're all being very polite. I mean, it, David, you start, and I'll, I'll bring Patrick in afterwards. I, I will convene in that case. And similarly say, yes, you're right. Sustainable forest management is a, is a well-developed term which has been developing, I would guess, over the last um, 15, 20 years. Mm. And it's, it's part and parcel of what Scottish forestry is all about, and it's right that it should be at heart of the bill. Yeah, Patrick. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the reasons why it should be important is it puts uh, Scottish forestry in a context of, of international forestry. Um, still, a lot of the timber used in this country is important. Uh, and if we are uh, requiring standards of forest management in other countries, then uh, we should have our own house in order. And having our own house in order is sustainable forest management. OK, Richard. Yes, I support that. I mean, our forum uh, thinks that the, the sustainable forest management should be linked to the UK forest standards. I think that's a point that's been discussed before. And the bill should place greater emphasis on biodiversity. Okay. Yeah. Peter, do you want to go to the, the next yeah, question? I mean, the, the bill requires ministers to prepare a, a, and publish a forestry strategy. Um, would you like to see that the bill state what particular issues must be included in, in a, a forest strategy, for instance? Yeah, how, does it, how do you think a forest strategy, how does it, you think it should look, or what should it include, and what, and what does it need to do? I, I don't think that's a matter for the bill, to be quite honest. I think that's a matter for the development of the, of the forestry strategy, mm. uh, that the, the, the bill should uh, enable and empower government to, to uh, produce a forestry strategy. Um, but the, the, the scope of a forestry strategy is going to be fairly wide. Uh, in some areas, it could be strategic. In some areas, it could be a bit more detailed there. But that's a matter for the development of the strategy. Claire? Um, I certainly would like, I'm, I'm glad there is reference to it. I'm glad it would be in, in the Act. Um, it would be nice to see a, a furtherance of that to say that ministers would have a duty to enable the delivery of, rather than just prepare and publish. It gives it some sort of um, direction. Um, and I wonder, from, following on from the discussions this morning, whether there should be a link made here somewhere, perhaps not in the bill, but to local authority forest and woodland strategies which pick up that local distinctiveness and flavour. David. Conveners, I think it might make sense for the Act to say that the strategy needs to be revised, for example, once every 10 years. Okay. So, yeah. so a review clause within the strategy, within the bill? And do you think, do you think that strategy should also, as Stuart Goodall suggested, should also suggest a bit of ambition and, and uh, you know, uh, targets to meet and, and that sort of thing? We're, we, we know we're, we're trying to achieve the 10,000 hectares and maybe go to 15. Should, should that uh, be in, included in this strategy, do you feel? You, you, all, you all nodded there, so the one so person yes. that didn't was Richard, so I'm <laughs> going to go to Richard. I don't know if that was a careful ploy. I think that there should be a time limit on the production of a national strategy in the first place. So, I mean, you know, two years. And also, as I said before, it's all very well having a national strategy, but uh, the, the, the strategy needs to be enabled to be taken down to a regional level. Um, and Scotland is so diverse. Uh, it, it, you can have an over, overarching strategy, but that needs to then devolve down into local strategies. OK, Claire. Do you, do you want to, to come back on that, or are you happy with It that? was really just to reiterate, yes, I do agree that there should be an ambition <coughs> set in the strategy. Yeah. Okay. 
I think maybe we'll move on to the next theme, Stuart. Uh, thank you. I think this is fairly brief, this one probably. Um, the responsibility for uh, silviculture and uh, tree health comes together, uh, basically bringing uh, Plant Health Act 67 of the Plant Variety and Seeds Act 64 together in one place. Is that good news or bad? Who would like to... to and you can just that? nod and say it's good news, if you will. I mean, if you think it's all good news, uh, then, then that's fine. David? Well, I think it's good news. All I would add is that it's one thing to have the powers, you also need the scientific exper expertise to deal yeah. with tree health. Yeah. And it's going back to the cross-border function, it's so important that we rebuild our expertise at a UK basis on tree health, and so that there's the expertise there as well as the powers. Okay. okay. Does anyone want to add anything to that, or are you all agree? Yep. Okay, I maybe move on to the Deputy Convener. Gail Ross has got the next theme. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, Again, to, to go back to the question that I asked the first panel about sustainable forest management and to concentrate on section nine, um, it states that the land must be managed in a way that promotes sustainable uh, forest management. Will it make any difference on the ground? And would you like to see any changes? And also to pick up what Claire had said, it was something that I had written down after the last panel about how um, the, the planning system, how it does, it, does the bill integrate with local development plans and, and local woodland strategies as well? And just to add in the, the, the question that I had um, the last time as well, are you clear about what is designated as forestry land and other land? Right, I hope you've all remembered those three questions. Who, who'd, like to, who'd like to head off on that? Um... Patrick, do you want to start? I'll go first, if you like. Um, I could almost answer these, uh, answer these uh, in the opposite direction of, yeah, that you asked them. That I, no, I'm not clear. Um, I'm clear what sustainable forest management is in my own mind, um, and I think I know what sustainable development is. Um, this bill is a forest and land management bill. It's not a forestry bill. Uh, so therefore, there, there, there's a right from the start. There's other land in, in, in involved in this. Um, I think I'm right in saying that by any definition of sustainable forest management, um, there is a requirement for open space uh, w w within that forest, if you like. So, in other words, not not all forest land carries trees. Um, and if you look at the National Forest Estate, I think Stuart gave, gave statistics for how much open space there the, the, the was early, earlier on. Um, so there is land that's managed in conjunction with forests, which is forest land, even though it doesn't carry trees. Um, there is farmland um, currently managed by the Forest Commission in, in, in some form or another. Um, and you can, you can see if, if, if uh, the powers uh, come through in this to, to, uh, for Forest and Land Scotland to manage other land on behalf of, of government ministers, that the, there'll be a huge continuum of different types of land. Um, I think one of the concerns that I would have then is, and again it was voiced by, by, by the earlier panel, was that uh, sustainable uh, development may well trump was the term used, sustainable forest management. If ministers see a potential for um, another land use that is preferential to forestry, then sustainable development kicks in. And sustainable forest management is left behind. And I think that's my concern, if you, if you understand what I'm saying there. Yeah. Richard, you would like to uh, uh, Gail mentioned integration with local plans and this sort of thing. I mean, that, that will come through in, in regional forestry strategies, I would suggest. It's not something for the bill itself. But... Um, uh, Claire or David, do you have a, a view on other land and, and forestry land and, and the definition and sustainability? Um, other than I was very confused by it too, and that was on several readings of Section 9 and Section 13. Um, and I was concerned, as, as Patrick's already um, intimated, that the, the trumping of sustainable development over sustainable forest management. When I first read through, I thought, well, maybe an answer to that would be, as you have in Section 9.3, um, 
you are saying ministers can use the land, manage the land, having regard to the forestry or to the Scottish to the forestry strategy. I beg your pardon. Maybe to have a, a similar uh, sentence or end of a sentence in section 13. But I mean, we were talking earlier. Um, I wasn't sure whether section 13 referred to other land or whether it referred to forestry land and other land. So yes, I'm confused by that. Those definitions, those subjects, sections. Okay. So you think it's too ambiguous? Yes, thank you. Is there any follow-up? No, I'm okay with that. Okay, um, we'll move on to the next thing, if we may, which is uh, Jamie. Just to, uh, obviously we had a conversation earlier and I believe some of you were sitting, listening in on that, so we, we went into quite minute detail on Section 13, but I think just to take a more a step back, I'd really be keen to get a broader view from you. I think someone said earlier that this isn't just a forestry bill, this is a forestry and land management bill. Giving uh, the complexities and perhaps ambiguities of some of the sections around what constitutes forestry land or non-forestry land, whether it should be used for forestry or sustainable development and so on. Is this bill the right place to, uh, to tackle uh, those, uh, uh, those issues around land management in general? Uh, you know, do you have any views on whether these should be separated from a forestry bill? Because in effect, I feel like uh, perhaps some of the evidence we've had uh, leads, leads us to think that we are, you know, it's trying to do too much in this bill. Uh, David, do you want to? Yes, come here. I mean, my view is that the policy intention here is unclear. Is the policy intention simply, for example, to allow the Forestry Commission to run starter farms on the National Forest Estate, which is great? Or is the policy intention here, for example, for the new body to take on the management of National Nature Reserves from SNH, or is it to allow the new body to do... I mean, we just don't know. Okay, does... Claire, do you want to come in on that? Um, I, I certainly can sympathise with the question, is this trying to do too much? And if you're looking back at the 67 Act and saying, well, yes, it's obviously expanding and extending from that. Um, the only other thing I would say, that Forestry Commission staff do manage non-forestry land, however we define that, and I wouldn't want the bill to restrict them doing their very good job that they do just now. I wouldn't want the bill to restrict them from doing that, continuing into the future. Um, so, does Patrick, Richard, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, uh, um, uh, if I may. Um, I think one of the things that, that, that we are starting, to, that's starting to look like a success in, in forestry and land management in Scotland is integrated land use. Um, which is, deserves another definition all of its own, as well as sustainable forest management and sustainable development. But it's something, uh, when I was at university in the, in the 1970s, that it was a, a golden goal, um, integrated land use in, in, in Scotland. And we're, we're starting to talk about it very positively and starting in some way to achieve it. So um, speaking against the idea that this bill is too far reaching, um, if, we were to, if it was restricted purely to forestry, say, then we'd be shutting forestry back in a silo, which it doesn't deserve to be in, and, and, and trying try to keep it open uh, at, the, at the same time, trying to keep it clear is going to be a, a, a nice balancing act. Okay. Uh, David. I would oh, sorry, Richard. Certainly support that, and I've spent half a century trying to integrate land management forestry, farming, development, etc. And I think it would be wrong uh, to limit this bill entirely to forestry. I think the whole point is to try and bring in um, other integrated land management, as others have said. So I, I, it's not something specifically that our forum has discussed, but I, I feel sure that they would agree with me that, that would be the correct way of approaching. Okay. Uh, perhaps just as a quick follow-up, um, we had quite a substantial written uh, response from the Highland and Islands Forestry Forum, um, and I think their views were very clear uh, in written format, and this could be a simple yes or no. And the first question uh, posed to them, do you agree with the proposed approach for a dedicated forestry division in the Scottish Government and an executive agency to manage a national forestry estate? Their answer was no. Uh, we recommend that these should be managed by an arm's length NGBP. Could I ask for your view on that? Yeah, uh, Patrick. Yeah. Um, 
I think what you have in front of you was uh, a, a copy of their response to the public consultation back in October, November last year, or, or, or whatever it was. Uh, and um, I just worked on the presumption that you've had been made a, has been made available to you the response from the other forestry forums to that consultation. I don't uh, have it in front of me. That's no, you, you won't have it in front of you. But, but, you, but, but, but you, uh, you should have yeah. access to it. Uh, and I think I think. Um, Certainly speaking for South Forum, I think all the forums would probably say yes to that question. Do we agree with, with, with the written paper you have in front of you? Sorry, to, just to clarify, do you agree with their response or do you agree with the proposed? We the agree approach? with their response um, that, that uh, a, a dedicated forestry division within government is not, is, is not the right way forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, David, if you want to briefly just add. To, to just to explain that all these regional forums had their own discussions in different parts of Scotland last autumn, and it was only when we came together a few weeks ago that we realised we were all of one voice in opposing the proposal. I, I guess that, that, that's almost helpful if you're, if you're all together on that. that I think, Jamie, we'll leave, leave that if you're happy on that. Thank you. And move on next to Mike. Um, Thank you. I mean, can I just preface my question by saying that the bill gives tremendous increased powers to ministers on compulsory purchase. But in addition, must put into sort of questions of the context that you've been getting, and I'm glad the, the panel members are listening to this as well, that um, we can only amend what's in this bill before us as MSPs. We, we can only put down amendments that Parliament will vote on on what's in the bill. When the regulations come forward, we can't amend the regulations. So whatever the minister decides... That's it. We can either reject it or pass it, so we can't amend it. So it's really important to find out what you feel should be in, in, in this bill or not, as far as, and I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on compulsory purchase. So it's, with, that, with that in mind, we can only amend what's before us in this bill. So I'm particularly concerned about Section 16, which changes the power of ministers to compulsory purchase land. Um, and the 1947 Act, it said we could, ministers can compulsory purchase land for sustainable forest management, but what this bill does is give enormous power to ministers, basically, to compulsory purchase land for sustainable development, without defining specifically what sustainable development is. I'd like to ask you whether you have concerns about this. I'm very happy to go to it briefly, if I may, just... David, you and Claire, I see, and, and, and Richard. So, David, if you'd start. I, d I don't understand why they've got this compulsory purchase um, provision in the bill, because to my knowledge, the Forest Commission, the last time the Forest Commission tried to do compulsory purchase was in Norfolk in the 1950s, and the parliamentary inquiry told them they shouldn't do it, and they never tried to use those powers since, as far as I know. Claire. Um, I, yes, yeah, similarly have concerns, as David's expressed, that I don't see, if it's not being used now, why included, and, and especially with a broader reach, that is a great concern. Richard. Our, our forum discussed this, and they were very concerned that the, uh, the Scottish Government needs to clarify exactly what this means, what is the objective in Clause 16. I mean, compulsory purchase is a, is a minefield, as we all know, and if it's not very carefully focused, um, it'll get mired down in the courts, I would suggest. So we're, we're not at all happy with the way Clause 16 um, reads. It could encompass a whole raft of unintended things. Uh, so it should be much more focused, if it should be there at all. And as David said, in, in the purely forestry terms, um, it's hardly ever been used, but of course we're dealing with other than just forestry, so this could lead on to all sorts of things in the way it's framed at the moment. Mike, Mike do you want to follow that up? No, I think that's a very helpful response. I think what, as far as I'm summarising what the response is, that there's not a great deal of happiness about expanding the power from the 1947 Act. That's what I've taken from that. I mean, the one question which, we, which wasn't asked to the previous panel is the disposal, disposal of land relating to uh, the forest estate. Uh, in the past, this parliament had agreed that it, there could be a certain amount of rationalisation, but the money used from, from the sale of forestry assets would be put back into forestry assets. 
is, is just as a general question, is that the way you see it should be going forward? Or are you happy for the forest estate to be sold off and for that money not to go back into the assets, but to go into the, say, the running of the forest estate? Just a, a very quick answer, if I may push you on that. Da David, do you want to? Well, the Central Scotland Regional Forest Forum under understands that the rationale for the cur current relatively low level of disposals and looks at them pretty carefully and would certainly be extremely concerned about the level of disposals, for example, which the Scottish Government proposed seven or eight years ago when it thought about getting rid of 25% of the, of the state, would be very concerned about that sort of level of disposal. Claire, can I ask you, do you have an opinion on that? Um, perhaps not directly answering your question, convener, but we, have, um, we would be worried about what purpose would that land be disposed for and what controls would be in place to make sure there wasn't a net loss of wood and cover. Okay. Patrick? Nothing different to add to that. No. Uh, Rich, do you have anything different to add? It's not so important who owns the forestry, it's how it's managed and that it's, it's extended and created. Okay. Um, maybe we could move on to the uh, next theme, which is John. Convener, um, sections 18 to 20 in the bill uh, talk about uh, community bodies and potentially delegating functions to community bodies. So really, any thoughts around that? I mean, for example, the definition of a community body, are you comfortable with that? Um, I suppose, you know, should it be in the legislation? Should it be elsewhere? The fact that ministers do have some powers to vary that, and I'm just looking at one of the definitions, which is or requirements, which is there should be 20 members. I mean, I, I'm really wondering if that needs to be in the bill itself, or if we give the, the minister power to vary that. And then the concept of if there is compulsory purchase, as we've just discussed, is it appropriate that uh, you know the function of managing that be delegated to a community body? Um, who'd like to lead on that? David, you're... Right. Well, I understand that the, the reason for having these provisions in the bill is because it's already possible for, for communities to buy land from the Forestry mm. Commission, but it isn't always possible for the communities to afford to buy land. So the reason for this provision is to allow arrangements for the communities to take on long-term leases of Forestry Commission land, which is great. And I think the, the Section 19 is simply to try to find some language to make sure it's a bona fide community mm -hmm. activity rather than something that's sort of masquerading as a community activity. Okay. So in that sense, I'm comfortable with it. Okay. Um, does anyone, is it, I think one of the questions John was happy was, was whether land would be bought and then handed on to a community. I mean, is it... Yeah, I mean, that, that was a fairly clear answer. I mean, I'm happy with that, but I don't know if any others have uh, comments on that. Uh, Patrick. D just a, a point of detail, and I suppose the definitions that I'm not familiar with, but as we've been talking a lot about definitions this morning, it would seem to be that definition of community should be the same uh, in, in, in this bill yes. as in the Community Empowerment Act and in the Land Reform Act. Are you aware of any reasons why it's not? No. I, I, no. I okay. Thank you. Can, can I bring Claudia in at this stage? Uh, thank you, Gavina. And uh, still morning. <laughs> Good morning to the panel. Uh, could I... I'm not sure what you said, but I am sure what I'm saying. Sorry. Could, could I just ask you about what interest you have experienced uh, uh, in your capacity in your forums uh, from community groups in the management and purchase of, of um, forest land and indeed um, beyond that, because we do have the integrated land use strategy, which... Um, I think both Patrick and Richard have highlighted um, a keenness towards. Could, could you make any comment on that? Patrick, looks like you were named, so you, you're <laughs> going to have to say something. Um, I, I'll go first. I, I suppose I got to declare an interest on it as well, because I sit in the Community Asset Transfer Evaluation Panel. Um, but if I could set that aside and, and, and talk about it from a forestry forum perspective, um, very little interest is the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, David. Yeah. Well, within, within central Scotland, it tends to be much more about community engagement in woods in and around towns, which is, which is a different story, really, from community leasing or community ownership. It's, it's about engagement. But what I'd also say is, if I think our, if our colleague from Could the... Could I just stop you on that? Would, that? would you see that as in any way part of this, um, this bill? No, that doesn't require... That just requires the way in which Forestry Commission yep. Scotland has been engaging right, with fine, communities. And... If I think if our colleague from the Highlands and Islands were here, he'd be the one answering this question because the activity tends to be much more, not I'm saying exclusively in the Highlands, but much more in the Highlands and Islands. 
Um, Claire and then Richard. I would certainly um, reflect what, what Patrick finds in the south of Scotland. We don't have very much interest from communities in Grampian Forest Reform's area. There are community woodlands managed by communities, but on the forum itself, very little. Richard. Is that the makeup of the forum, or is that...? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Richard. I would just add that our forum, which is Perth and Argyle, I mean, we've, we've been on visits to community groups in Mull in particular, and I would say that is real interest. It, it perhaps mirrors this sort of highlands and islands thing. Uh, but uh, clearly, th there is, uh, in, in those parts of the country at least, real interest in, in community and communities acquiring Forestry Commission land and running it themselves in certain circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, if we can move on, uh, Fulton. Uh, with, you, with your theme next. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Thanks, panel, uh, for your attendance. Um, I'm just wondering, do you agree with the Scottish Government that a broader view of um, failing is needed? Uh, and are you content uh, that what is proposed is consistent with sustainable forest management? Who'd like to lead on that? Um, David, do you want to go on that? Well, I, I heard the earlier discussion, Convener, and I think, broadly speaking, agree with what people said earlier, that there need to be felling regulations. There's a bit of surprise as to how much detail comes into the primary legislation as to what should go into the secondary legislation. And the definition of felling seems slightly bizarre, to say the least. So I, need it, I think it needs looking at, but certainly there needs to be some sort of control over felling. OK. Um, Patrick, do you want to concur with what David said? OK. So, so too much information in the bill and... and and, and not a good enough definition. Is that, is, is that the general panel feeling? It seems to me that the, the balance uh, of... The amount of detail on, on felling uh, is, is not... Is the, there's more emphasis given to that than is perhaps necessary when you compare it with other, uh, other matters in, in, in the bill. OK, Claire, do you want... Um, picking up a, a different area that's, I think, been discussed earlier, we're quite pleased to see the... the Dislinking, that's not a verb, but you know what I mean, um, of illegal felling having to be having to have a conviction before you can actually put on the power to restock. So I think it's useful that that's now been separated. Okay. Um, Jamie, do you want to develop that a bit more? Yeah, I, I, actually, I'm, I'm perhaps a little bit confused over, over some of the views on this. I think uh, that certainly the notes that, that we had on the felling sections of the bill. Uh, stated that it was actually sort of lacking in detail and that, that the bill wouldn't have really deal with the specifics of felling regulations and licenses, exemptions, etc. That would be dealt with in regulation. But I've also heard a few times this morning people saying there's a bit too much detail on felling. So, uh, you know, which is it, is, is sort of your view? Who, David, I'll start with you. Well, I'd say you need a lot of detail. You need to exempt, for example, gardens and churchyards, etc., etc., etc. But uh, the question is whether you need all that detail in the primary legislation where it can just simply be dealt with by regulation. Does, does anyone want to add anything to that? Um, Jimmy, are you happy with no, that? Question. Fulton, you, you, I think you had another question on forestry. Yeah, thanks again, convener. The, um, the panel before you, if, I, don't, I don't know if, if all of you were in or not, um, it seemed to unanimously uh, I agree that they didn't think the provisions would make much uh, difference or changes on, on the ground. Uh, what's, what's your view on that as, as a panel? Uh, Claire? Uh, sorry, in relation to failing. Again, so. I would agree with the previous panel. I don't see that there's any reason to be much significant change, if any. OK. Um, David, do you have concerns, or are you, are you happy? Yeah. happy? OK. Can okay. I just yes, um, absolutely. Sorry. I'm just going back to the point that, that Jamie made. <clears throat> because of this idea of there's either there's too much in the bill or there's not enough in the bill. And on this issue of, of felling, I mean, section 24 says regulations under subsection one may provide that 20, section 23 doesn't apply to particular categories of person, particular places, particular circumstances, trees of particular description, without going into any of the detail. And things that will be, will be coming forward in regulations are things like appeals against decisions by Scottish ministers. Um, uh, applications for felling permissions, decision on application to fell a tree, compensation, felling directions. So I go back to the point I said earlier. The whole point about putting a bill through Parliament is that it has proper scrutiny and that MSPs are able to amend what the government is bringing forward in a bill. 
if it's in the, if it if it, all this is delegated to regulations, we don't have any chance to get it right, to make amendments to that. So this is our opportunity to say, actually, they should be in the bill, or we're content that they shouldn't. Can I just make absolutely clarify? Are you happy? Are you content? that um, these regulations are left to Scottish ministers to decide rather than Parliament? Um, he'd like to, David, do you want to go on that? Or? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, you do get into very technical issues, such as, for example, the sort of de minimis exemption of five cubic metres per calendar quarter. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of detail in the Forestry Act 1967, which I think arguably could go into secondary legislation so that it can be updated and so forth mm -hmm. in a relatively street, streamlined way. Okay. I, I, but I think Mike, Mike's concern is that if it's put in a regulation, it can arbitrarily be changed and Parliament can't look at it. Is, is, is that the point you're making? The point I'm making is, in is this case, Parliament so? can't amend anything that the government... In, in practice, no. what tends to happen is that the government brings forward regulations because there are a lot of good things in the regulations and there are other issues there. So they tend to go forward without, without being thrown out because MSPs are reluctant to do that. But what we can do is amend John. the bill without the, the loss of the bill, if you see what I mean. And that's the question I'm asking. Are you therefore content that a lot of the detail which we cannot amend will be given to ministers to do? Um, and I understand that. Sorry, I, I, I should also have made my point clear mm. is that the regulations have to come for scrutiny as well. So, so they will come oh, yes. through the, the, the procedure. Absolutely, thing. but we can't, we can't amend yeah. it, that's the point I'm making. So. It, does anyone want to add anything in light of what Mike's just said? Mike. Sorry, Richard. Just one point that came through to our forum, and Claire has already mentioned it, is that the Forest Commission seem unable to serve a restocking notice, and restocking is very important, without getting a court order. Now, that's the sort of thing that maybe should go in the primary legislation. I don't know, but that is a, seems to be the single most important issue that comes to our notice at least. Okay, maybe, maybe we can move on to the, the next question. I think because uh, Fulton's got one more, I think, on, on felling. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was kind of covered by Mike as well, but I suppose it was just um, if the panel uh, were aware of any circumstances where uh, Scottish ministers might refuse an application for felling. So, would anyone like to answer that? Sorry. David, do you want to go on that? I, just to clarify, I think what normally happens is, is the powers are in the background and there's often negotiation about felling. So in large forests, what will come out will be an agreed forest design plan, agreed between Forestry Commission staff and, and the owner. And the, it's only rare that you actually get occasions when there's actual questions of denying felling permission. For example, there was an oak wood over in East Lothian a few years ago where the owner wanted to clear fell the oaks and there's a huge row about it. And um, potentially felling permission for felling those oaks could have been denied. In fact, there was a long process of negotiation and a satisfactory solution was found, but they're good to have them in the background. Okay. Unless anyone's got anything to add to that, I may move on to the next theme, which is Peter. Yeah, I mean, it kind of falls on from what we've been discussing. It's, a, it's about the, the, the compliance and notice to comply provisions, and we've kind of been speaking about that. Um, do you feel that the, the compliance and notice to comply provisions are an improvement in the bell and what we've got just now, or could they be improved further? Are they... Claire, would you, would you... I must admit to being somewhat confused and uncertain of the, um, the need to register um, any felling approvals. I wasn't certain whether that was for all felling approvals, whether they be a felling licence or a long-term forest plan, and registering with land registry and then deregistering. I wasn't quite sure whether that was the case. I'm interested to hear what the interpretation actually is. Patrick, do you want to add anything to that? I don't add anything, thanks, though. Okay. Peter, I mean, do you want to develop that at all? Or? Well, I mean, I, I, just, I just do wonder, um, you know, it's all about the, the, the notices to comply with continuing conditions about felling directions, restocking directions. It's all about uh, powers to ensure that directions relating to felling are complied with, directions related to if, if, if something is not being complied with, complied with that, that gives powers to uh, ensure that the action is actually undertaken 
that it, com it comes up through the bill in, in, in various sections, right through the bill, this compliance stuff. And I just wonder if, you're, if you're, you are content with what's in there, and, 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 and is there other things that should be in there, improvements that could be made to all that uh, compliance regulation, or are you content with what the, the bill states? Uh, David. Well, say with respect, convener, is the danger of looking at the fine, fine detail and losing the big picture. The big picture here is through this bill, we're losing the Forestry Commission, which has had around 100 years of history and has done the job of, in a sense, me meaning these notices of compliance and stuff aren't needed by and large because there's been a long process of negotiation mm. and working with forest owners and forest managers on the ground to get things done. Mm. And therefore, notices of compliance, they sit in the background of the legislation. They're not actually called forward because of the, that, the way in which forestry arrangements have been made. And the big thing you're doing through this bill is potentially throwing out that, that structure. Yeah, okay. Richard, you... I suppose we're used to seeing these uh, sort of regulations in the background. It, 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 it seems to work through the system that David's just mentioned. So um, I don't think we have any particular... I don't have any particular comment on them. Okay. I don't see them as threatening particularly. OK, we may move on to the next theme, which is Schroeder. Are there any of the provisions that were in the 1967 Act that should have been carried forward to this Act that are missing? Not the things that have already been discussed, obviously, by committee, but anything different. And indeed, are there any unintended consequences from what is in the new bill? Um, David, do you want to... Well, the big thing that's missing is the existence of the Forestry Commission or a Forestry Commission Scotland. Does anyone want to add to that, or do you think that's the biggest miss? Rhoda, do you, do you want to push that at all? I, th I think that's been covered earlier, where okay. people have expressed those concerns, but I was thinking more about the detail of, of the bill. Are there things that have unintended consequences? And I think we're aware of the concerns about the issues around um, uh, the Forestry Commission, but are there other things in the bill that maybe throw up unintended consequences? or indeed things that are missing within the rule? Claire. Um, we had one member um, just earlier this week express some um, confusion, not confusion, that's possibly the wrong word, um, a curious that the powers of ministers to um, enable or, in, or make hare and rabbit control um, happen, she thought that was quite an interesting deletion from this bill. Okay. Right, um, maybe we'll move on to the, 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 the final theme. John. Yes, uh, thanks, Convener, again. Um, just on the financial memorandum, it uh, states fairly categorically that there will be no financial implications for local authorities, other bodies, individuals or businesses as a result of the bill, but by implication, any financial impact will be on the government itself. Uh, any comments on that? Are you all comfortable with that? Does, uh, David. I was interested that in the financial memorandum they were talking about one-off costs of between six and twelve million pounds, largely for IT. And I think at your last session you had some scepticism about the IT costs. And then I looked through the financial memorandum to try to see what savings they thought would come from, like the proposal to move Forestry Commission Scotland to a forestry division. And there didn't seem to be much in the way of proposed savings from the changes. So I wondered why. So I can ask why you thought there might be savings. Well, because they're wanting to make, as I've said repeatedly during this session, they're wanting to make a pretty fundamental change to the way in which Forestry Commission, the for forestry is organised in Scotland. And so I thought they might have had some justification on grounds of savings. But I, I, thought, I thought they were arguing that it was more democratic rather than cheaper. Well, interesting, that moves on to the governance point. And actually, when you look at the governance point, what we have at the moment is a way in which stakeholders have a much greater say through the non-executives who are appointed to become forestry commissioners or whatever the replacement might be, non-executive directors, whereas actually under the proposed arrangements it'll be much more opaque in the sense it'll just be a division within a directorate within the Scottish Government as opposed to, which, which, which is hidden within the Scottish Government website for example, as opposed to an organisation which people can know and can approach. OK, well, I'm probably not going into that area at the moment, but uh, anyway, on finances, nobody else feels that... R Richard indicated costs. that... Well, I may be going on a completely different track here, but 
um, if the bill is um, successful in um, increasing, uh, gradually the amount of forestry is going to increase by 10, 15,000 hectares a year as, as a result of support from the bill, clearly that's going to have an impact on local authorities, infrastructure, roads and this sort of thing. I mean, I may be going completely off track here, but uh, that, that is an implication. Do you think that's because of the bill, or is that well, uh, more because of the general aim to increase the forestry? The, that's the general aim, yeah. one of the general aims of the bill, isn't it? So there are bound to be implications from, from that. But that's mm -hmm. been ongoing for many years, so there's nothing new. It'll just increase a bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, th I think that's at the end of our uh, session. I I'd like to thank you all, David, Claire, Patrick, Richard, for, for coming this morning and, and giving evidence. Uh, it's always useful to hear um, uh, views of other people and, and, and allows us to make an informed decision. So thank you. I'd like to briefly suspend the meeting. I'd like to ask uh, committee members to remain seated in their seats so we can move directly on um, and ask the witnesses to leave as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'd like to now move to agenda item two, that is the public petition PE1598 on protecting wild salmonoids from sea, sea lice from Scottish salmon farms. Uh, previous consideration of this petition is detailed in paper three. The committee did receive a letter in April uh, from, the commission, uh, from the petitioner. I'd also like to point out uh, that members of the committee visited a salmon farm uh, barely two weeks ago uh, to look at how that operated. Um, I, I'd like to ask if there's any comments on, on the petition before I move on to, to make a, a suggestion uh, as, for, as far as further action on the, on the, uh, thing. So on the petition. Sorry, Stuart and, did it, and John. Sorry, sorry. Uh, just for completeness and on the record, I have with the community visited his uh, salmon uh, farm recently and I have met uh, representatives of the petitioners. So I've had views to me personally, which I won't directly share. Um, clearly both the uh, salmon farming industry uh, and uh, the wild salmon industry are both significant and important industries for Scotland and I think in whatever we choose to do with this, it's a perfectly proper petition and we should, we should certainly treat the matter seriously and make sure we can come to a balanced view at the end of the day and help inform public policy. Okay, uh, John. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, there are no par yes. not participating in your recent uh, visit that your, your, yourself and others went on. I likewise have visited a farm and uh, it was on the back of a, a request to, to come and do so, but also um, keen to be seen to be addressing the understandable public concern there is about this issue and growing public concern. So I understand you're going to make a, a suggestion and we'll maybe take it forward from there. Uh, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I've also visited a fish farm in, when I was previously a member of the Parliament, uh, although not recently, and this is an issue that has been going on for years. And I think uh, it's absolutely, really, it's a really important issue that we should address. And uh, I look forward to the suggestions that you, you, you're going to make, hopefully, in a moment. Um, and I will need to chastise myself for being remiss and not saying at the outset of this discussion that I should have declared an interest in that I do have 
uh, a wild fishery interest in my register of interest, which members can, can look at. So I chastise myself, um, and I take the points that have been uh, raised. I, I would suggest that the committee like, might like to consider um, continuing the petition or allowing the petition to continue and to look probably early in 2018 to address the points that John has raised and other people on the committee have raised to ca carry out an inquiry in, into aquaculture. I think uh, it would be extremely uh, helpful to try and find common ground between um, the, the interests which Stuart has said is very important to Scotland as a whole. Uh, and I would seek the committee's approval uh, to carry that out. Um, are we agreed on that? Okay, there is one uh, other thing to bring to the committee's attention. There has been an opportunity to have some research carried out by SPICE uh, of the literature and environmental impacts of farm salmon. And I would propose to ask them to carry that out in advance of the inquiry that uh, we, we, we will carry out. And I also would like to make it clear that I have been uh, in conversation with the convener of the uh, Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee to discuss how we can look at this together to make the best possible impact. Uh, Mike. Thank you, Kennedy. Can I just ask, make a request that the research also looks particularly at these issues, for instance, in other countries like, like Norway um, and Ireland, so that this issue has been going on for years and there's specific research that's been done in those, those countries which I think could be useful to the committee. Absolutely. I mean, it is a literature review and it will be as broad and, and far-ranging as we can do to allow a proper informed decision to be made. So if everyone's happy with that, I'd like to move on to agenda item four on the committee. Uh, sorry, agenda item three, uh, which is the consideration of two negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments and there have been no representations to the committee directly on these instruments. Are there any comments uh, that the members would like to make on those instruments? So is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to these instruments? Okay, that is agreed and that concludes today's meeting. Uh, and I'd like to close the meeting.